we have a great hope. Our Lord Jesus Christ has accomplished it, and uh, we are very grateful for that. This morning, uh, we have the privilege of a pastor from our Sunday church, Countryside. Pastor Otto Skoog is going to come and preach to us. Um, he is a, a fervent student of the word, and uh, by God's grace, he, he desires and actually lives that out. Um, he is zealous for good works because of his love for God's word. So, Pastor Otto, you come and you preach from God's word, and we are grateful for you to be here today. All right. Let's pray together. Father, what a privilege to be here with your people in this place, gathered close, praising your name with the ability to look to your word and to freely worship you. We are so grateful for that. God, may we never take that great privilege for granted. Father, as I stand here in this place, I, I feel incredibly moved uh, by what you've done uh, for this body and for this city. You know I love Lawrence, Lord, and, and I'm so excited when you sent J.D. here to preach the word and to see that your word is having its effect, that your gospel is changing lives, that you are transforming people from enemies into family, from those who were opposed to you and rebellious to you at every turn and to those who love you with all of their being. And God, we pray now as we look into your word together that you would do that again, that you would use your word to transform our hearts, that you would shape us and mold us and make us to resemble more of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we would leave this place displaying the fruit of the Spirit and that we would go into our neighborhoods and into our workplaces and live transformed lives and share the good news of the one who made all that possible, your great son and our glorious savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, it's great to be with you this morning. Uh, I uh, truly mean uh, what I said. It's kind of emotional to be here uh, I preached everywhere but the double tree. I remember the railway station and the train <laughs> zooming by. Nothing stranger than that when you're trying to worship God. But what was cool about that is people were here. They were there to worship God, and that train was not a distraction. And I found that incredibly refreshing. I remember the Carnegie building, and I loved that building. I thought, man, this building is super cool. It has so many neat features and the history here, in, and the, the fact that there is a church in this building was so encouraging in downtown Lawrence and filled with people who loved God and wanted to see the name of Christ spread out from Lawrence. And then uh, two weeks ago, I came up and, or over and had breakfast with JD, and he took me uh, through the building, and uh, I was just so amazed at what God has done. And to see all of you here this morning and to be uh, privilege to speak uh, the word of God to you is, is just amazing. And so if I seem really excited as I preach, just I wanted you to know where that came from. All right? It comes from being in a place where God is gathering his people, and I fully believe he can use them to transform the lives of countless people in this city. So praise the Lord for that. Hey, if you have a Bible today, open it to uh, Romans chapter 8. We're going to be at the end section of Romans uh, chapter 8 this morning. I don't know if you've ever read anything or listened to anyone talking about or discussing or preaching uh, Romans chapter 8, but there's a consistent emphasis on the importance of this chapter to spiritual life. In fact, it is often referred to as the greatest chapter in all of Scripture. And I can't argue with that. I got to begin preaching Romans chapter 8 as we entered into the lockdown, and 
uh, continued on. And when I finished Romans chapter 8, I praised God because I needed Romans chapter 8 for such a time as this. It's an amazing chapter. It contains some of the most encouraging truths in Scripture and some of the most powerful statements about the work of God in all of the Bible. So I can truly say, I love Romans chapter 8. The very first statement made by Paul in verse 1 of this chapter really sets the stage for something special. Paul has just lamented the continuing presence of sin in his life in chapter 7. And so when he begins chapter 8 with these words, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You can't wait to hear what he has to say about this. I mean, all of us live with the presence of sin in our lives. And when it rears its ugly head, it's easy to despair. It's easy to entertain doubts about our own relationship to God. It's easy to wonder how God could love someone like us. So when life gets hard and when you're facing something difficult or tragic, it's easy for us to wonder if God has abandoned us. We wonder if maybe his love for us has waned. We imagine that we're under the condemnation of God. And it's very, very easy to lose hope. And we're not alone. If you've read the Bible, the Psalms contain statements that echo those thoughts. And you know, I'm sure that the most followers of Christ from time to time have entertained those thoughts. It's comforting for me to think that Paul ministered to people like us and that Paul, too, had his own struggles. And that, so that's why his words in verse 1, I think, are so powerful. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And after writing those words, Paul then lays out the basis for his confidence. Our union with Christ has given us access to incredible spiritual blessings. And the personal ministry of the Holy Spirit is at work in each of us who are believers in Christ in a transformative way. Because God is at work turning us into the very image of his Son. And truly, if you think about it, there's nothing more exciting than that reality. Nothing more exciting than that truth. That's what gets us out of bed, or it should get us out of bed in the morning. That today is another day when God works in my life, shaping me and molding me to be more like his glorious son. What we will be, Paul says in this chapter, is glorious. So if you're united to Christ by faith, you're no longer under condemnation. Instead, you have become a member of God's family and you are awaiting a glorious inheritance. And Paul teaches all of this in just 30 verses. In this passage that we're going to look at this morning, Paul is now putting a bow on this wonderful gift that is this great chapter. It's an exclamation mark upon his statement in verse 1 that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So follow along as I read from Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword as it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, 
we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So today in our passage, we're going to look at Paul's question, what then shall we say to these things? And I want to state four conditions and a final conclusion implied by this text that answers that question. Now his question in verse 31 comes from what we see really in all of the book of Romans, but especially what we see in verses 28 through 30, where Paul lays out the idea that in an uncertain world, there is something that we can know with absolute certainty. So what is it? It's this, that God works all things together for good, for those who love him, and for those who have been called according to his purpose. After making that statement, Paul, and it's a powerful statement, right? I mean, that's a powerful statement. There, he adds other incredible facts to it. What some have called the golden chain of salvation, foreknowledge, predestination, calling, justification, and glorification. And in the middle of all that, he makes this great statement, that God is working all things together to conform us to the image of his Son. He's conforming us to the image of Christ. Why? Paul tells us. So that Jesus might be the firstborn among many brothers. Siblings who are like him in every way that humanity can be like deity. That thought is mind-blowing. It's so glorious I can't even contemplate it. So Paul's question in our text comes in light of those statements. What then shall we say to these things? What needs to be said in light of this promise of salvation and its glorious goal? Well, Paul says, let me just put a bow on it. Let me stamp this promise of a faithful God with even more certainty. I want to erase with the statements I'm making here, says Paul, any doubts that might enter your mind about the fulfillment of this promise. So when sin creeps in and you begin to wonder, does God still love me? The answer will be yes. When you're suffering in this world and it's hard, and I mean, you know, it's really, really, really hard, no matter what you're facing. And you wonder, does God really love me? Is the love of God still with me? The answer will be yes. Because in our passage today, it is yes, yes, yes. So let me state the first condition in answer to the question, what then shall we say to these things? And it's this, if God is executing the plan, that's the first condition, if God is executing the plan, God is executing the plan. Remember the plan started with foreknowledge in verse 29. It started in eternity past and it ended with us being conformed to the image of Christ. It's a glorious ending, it's an incredible plan and God himself is the one executing the plan. It doesn't depend on you. <clears throat> it doesn't depend on your pastor or your deacons. It doesn't depend on your small group leaders or your Sunday school teachers. It doesn't depend on how often you fulfill your Bible reading schedule. It doesn't depend on that. Ultimately, it is God who is executing this plan now, without a doubt, he is using all of those people and all of the available tools that we have as believers in this century. But ultimately, it depends on his work. And Paul says that at the end of verse 31, where he says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Since the end of chapter 3, Paul has been laying out the incredible work of God in our salvation, in spite of all the sin and rebellion addressed in those first three chapters, God's plan of redemption has been in motion since before the foundation of the world. 
And it's a plan that emanated from the wisdom of God himself. It's a plan that is fulfilled by the power of God. It's a plan that has been accomplished by the Son of God. And it's a plan that is applied by the Spirit of God. God is executing the plan. Paul expressed this to the church in Philippi in Philippians 1.6, where he said, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. What God starts, he finishes. And God is executing this plan. There isn't anyone wiser than God. There isn't anyone more powerful than God. There isn't anyone more faithful or committed than God. So can anything change the outcome of this plan? The answer to that question is an unequivocal no. 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 No one or no thing can successfully foil God's plan of redemption. If God is for you, nothing or no one can change your eternal future, not even you. If God started it by transforming you and fulfilling in you his new covenant promises of a new heart and an indwelling spirit, then that is never going to change. That's exactly why Paul can say, there is therefore now no condemnation. And that's why he can walk down that golden chain of salvation, starting with foreknowledge and ending with glorified. Those whom he foreknew, he glorified. None of those links in that chain will break. Now, should that give you peace? Yes. In case you were searching for the answer, yes. Yes, that should fill us with hope, right? Yes, it should strengthen our faith. Absolutely, yes. It's impossible to thwart the will of God. His eternal plan will be completed. God is executing the plan, but in case this isn't enough, Paul goes on, secondly, to imply this condition. If God's son died for the plan, look at verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? So think with me for a minute about the fact that the Son of God died for you. I mean it really, think about it. It's something we hear often, but I don't think it's something that we think about. We don't imagine Jesus dying for us. I mean, think about what that means. God was so committed to this plan that he endured the ultimate act of rebellion. He endured the ultimate insult. He endured the ultimate pain. God the Father sent God the Son to die in your place. He sent him to be poor and tired. He sent him to be betrayed betrayed and rejected. He sent him to be mocked and insulted. He sent him to be falsely accused and tried. He sent him to be pushed around, stripped naked and beaten. And he sent him to be nailed to a cross for us. And all of that took place at the hands of men and women deserving the full force of God's wrath, his terrible wrath. So what does Paul say here? He did not spare his own son. He didn't spare him the hardship and the humiliation. He didn't spare him the suffering and the pain. And know this with certainty, he could have. He certainly is able to have ended it all. At any moment, he could have decided that it wasn't worth it. He could have annihilated creation with the word. But he didn't. He didn't spare his own son, but he gave him up. You know, we treasure the words of John 3.16. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And we can read those words and we catch the idea of love and we catch the idea of God giving his son, but we fail to see what Paul mentions here. He did not spare him. He was able. But he didn't spare him and instead he gave him his precious son as a gift. Now what greater gift could be given What greater cost could be endured? None. And that's Paul's point here. By choosing to give his own son the greatest gift he could ever give, would it really be possible that God would fail to keep the rest of his promises to you and to me? That he would fail to see his plan through all the way to the end? Is it possible that he could withhold all the spiritual blessings that the Son of God purchased with his death? No. It's not possible. And if that means doing everything in his power to keep us, then he will do it. That's why Jude could write in Jude 24, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. It's the point Jesus was making in John 10 when he said, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. If God did not spare his own Son, then he will see to it that all the blessings that Jesus came to secure for us by his death will become ours. If he did not spare his own Son, then how will he not graciously give us with Jesus all things? If we have Jesus, we can be assured that God will give us all that he has promised. Why? Because God's son died for this plan. What's the third condition in our text this morning? It's this. If God has declared the success of the plan, verse 33, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Now the logic is this. If God has declared you just or declared you righteous, then who can say otherwise? Now we know there's at least one creature that will try. We see that playing out in the book of Job, and we know that he still operates that way from Revelation 12.10, where it refers to Satan as the accuser of the brothers. It says there that he's actively accusing them day and night before God. Day and night he is before God, pointing to everything in your life that should offend a holy God. Every failing, every sin, every mistake, every thought that you have spoken aloud and to your wife in secret or every angry word that you have said to your kids or everything you have said behind your boss's back or gossip that you have spread to your neighbor, he's bringing it up before God day and night. But you know what? From knowing what I know about Romans chapter eight, the idea of that event taking place almost makes me smile. You say, smile? Smile because Satan's accusing us before God day and night, yes. Why? Why smile? Because this is a futile effort. His words are powerless. His words hold no sway. His words are less than persuasive. His words fall on deaf ears as far as God is concerned. He has wasted every second that he has spent before God uttering those accusations. Every 
single second he has wasted. You see, the reason we can stand before God is not because we're righteous. Satan's accusing us of sin will have no effect. God already knows that we lack perfect righteousness. So I'm not sure how God keeps a straight face in front of Satan. I'm not sure why he puts up with these constant accusations because our salvation has nothing to do with us maintaining a state of perfect righteousness. I have to wonder if Jesus reminds Satan of that. I have to wonder if Jesus ever reminds him moment after moment, accusation after accusation, that he's wasting his time because our righteousness is completely dependent upon the righteousness of Jesus Christ. His righteousness has become our righteousness. On the cross, God treated Jesus as if he had committed all our sins, and now he treats us and sees us as if we have lived Jesus' perfect life. When God declares us righteous, those are not empty words. They're an evaluation of the success of the Son of God in accomplishing the plan. And they're more than a declaration that sins have been paid. In a sense, that would have been enough to keep us from eternal torment, but this declaration of righteousness is a declaration of positive righteousness. When God looks at our balance sheet, he sees an infinite deposit of righteousness has been made on our behalf, a righteousness that has nothing to do with us. Listen to Paul's words in Philippians chapter three, verses eight and nine. For his sake, Jesus' sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. And as he wrote in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. If God declared us righteous, will he ever turn around and consider condemning us? Will he ever listen to the accusations and scratch his head and wonder, hmm, he's making a really good point here. Maybe I should listen to him. No. No, God is never going to listen. If he made us righteous in Christ, if he has granted us the righteousness of Christ, is there any reason to entertain those accusations of guilt? No, no, and no. Now, If you're here today and you have never confessed your sin to God, if you have never turned to Christ and his payment on that cross for your sin, if you have never repented of your sin and seen your life as one of rebellion towards God, needing either his forgiveness or deserving his wrath, if you have never confessed your need for a savior to the holy God, then you cannot share this confidence. If you don't believe your sins need to be paid for, if you don't believe that Jesus has come to pay for those sins, then you sit here condemned by the very words of Jesus himself. Jesus said, whoever believes in him is not condemned But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. You're not going to skate through because you're an American. You're not going to put one over on God because you got baptized or because you gave some money to the church. God is not going to be in awe of the fact that at one point, You helped your neighbor with something. 
or that you work hard at your job or that you actually do love your wife and are faithful to her. God will not be impressed by that. There is only one way. And Jesus said that. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me, Jesus said. No one. But if you have sought forgiveness and reconciliation with God through faith in his son, then these words of confidence in Romans chapter 8 are yours. They are precious promises to you. They belong to you, and you should grip them tightly. God has declared the success of this plan. Those whom he called, he justified. The fourth condition here. If God the Son prays for the fulfillment of the plan, verse 34, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. Christ Jesus is the one who died. Now, if you think that Christ who died for you would consider condemning for you? The Christ who died for you would consider condemning you? Do you? Do you think Jesus who endured everything I listed out earlier would condemn you? Would he decide later to condemn those he suffered for? No. But if anyone had a right to do it, it would be Jesus Christ. It would be the Son of God. But instead, what he has endured, what he faced when he walked this earth in much more uncertain times than we face today, in much more dark days than we face today, under much more oppressive rulers than we face today, what he faced made him sympathetic. In fact, Scripture calls him a sympathetic high priest. He understands the temptations that we face He understands the hardship of living in a fallen world. He witnessed the sin of his closest friends, even their betrayal. And he suffered for them. In Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, we read, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Paul says Christ Jesus is the one who died. But it isn't just Jesus' death that gives Paul confidence. Look back at verse 34. Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that who was raised. The fact that God raised him from the dead was an indication that God was satisfied with his sacrifice. He rose from the grave because the payment was sufficient. Justice was satisfied. We see that in Romans 4 verse 25 where Paul writes who, Jesus, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. God raised him up to say, it's done. It's sufficient. I'm satisfied with the payment of my son. So he didn't just die, he was raised. But look, but look at what's next. He was also exalted He's exalted at the right hand of God. There's some, this is something that the writer of Hebrews used to encourage and challenge the people that he was writing to. His readers had suffered a great persecution. And they were actually contemplating returning to the comfort and the safety of the synagogue. 
That's how bad it was. And in this written sermon, he, he says, basically, don't turn your back on Jesus. I know it's hard. I know you've suffered. I know you've been persecuted. I know your property has been plundered. I know some of you have been imprisoned, but don't turn your back on Jesus, the exalted one. Here's how he describes Jesus in chapter one, verse three. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And after making purifications for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He's been exalted to the place of honor. Trust him. He's been exalted to the place of honor. Believe him. He's been exalted to the place of honor. Stand strong in him. You know, when you're weak, when you're angry, when you're frustrated, you're standing or holding on to the wrong thing. If you want the confidence that Paul is teaching in this letter, if you want the confidence that can lead a man to write a sermon that says, don't turn your back on Jesus amidst all that they are suffering, if you want that confidence, if you want to see the anger and the frustration dissipate, if you want to grab on to hope again, then hold on to Jesus, the exalted one. Don't turn your back on him. He's at the exalted place. But how are we to stand? What gives us the confidence to keep standing strong? It's this. He's not in that place of honor as a silent observer. Oh, he died, he was raised, he was exalted, but he is not a silent observer. In that exalted position, he is praying for his people praying for them to persevere, praying for the fulfillment of God's plan for them. Listen to what the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 7, verse 25. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. The Son of God is at the right hand of God the Father, exalted to the place of honor, and he is interceding for us. And that's exactly what Paul says here at the end of verse 34. But what's really exciting, if you know this chapter, is that he's interceding for us, but he's not alone in that intercession. He's praying in concert with the Spirit according to the will of God. Look at verse 26. He's praying with the Spirit that, in all thi- that all things will work together for our good and our ultimate glory. God the Son is praying for the fulfillment of this plan. So finally, we come to the conclusion of all these conditionals. Four conditional statements. If God's executing the plan, if God's son died for the plan, if God has declared the success of the plan, if God the son prays for the fulfillment of the plan, then finally, God's plan for us to know the fullness of his love for all eternity will not fail. Now, I know that's long if you're trying to follow along. God's plan for us to know the fullness of his love for all eternity will not fail. It's what you need to walk out of here with. It's what Paul is trying to drive home to the people that he's writing to. God's plan for us to know the fullness of his love for all eternity will not fail. Look at verses 35 through 39. Now, I'm not going to read all these verses or comment on every statement that Paul makes, but I'm going to comment on some of them because all of these things are pointing back to the same thing. Nothing shall separate us from God's love. 
Nothing shall separate us from God's love. Paul says, this is an eternal love. He's referencing all that God has done through the gospel. Nothing can separate us from this eternal gospel love. Now that's hard for us to understand. Maybe not you, but it's hard for me to understand sometimes. Why? Because sometimes our love is conditional. Our love can be fickle. Our love can be conditioned upon expectations. And when someone lets us down or those expectations are not met, what do we say? I just don't love them anymore. We seem to fall out of love, and I think sometimes we think God is like this. We treat him as if he's like us. We wonder when life becomes hard if if he still loves us or if he's forgotten us. But the things we might face in this life are not an indication of the waning of God's love for us. And because of that, Paul in this text wants to erase every doubt we could ever conceive of. That's the purpose of his list here. He wants to eliminate every possibility that might come to us and cause us to wonder if God still loves us. If we're facing tribulation, like outside pressure or just the hardships of living in a fallen and difficult world, that doesn't mean that God's love for us is in jeopardy. If we're distressed, meaning something troubles us internally, maybe it's the distress of sin or just the distress of of family and friends abandoning you because of your faith in Christ. The presence of distress doesn't mean that God's love for us has weakened. If we face persecution or suffering for our faith in Christ, like the kind described in 1 Peter or in the letter to the Hebrews, or the, the, the presence of that persecution does not mean that God's love for us is any less than it was before. Famine, Paul says, or just hunger, or nakedness, or maybe just poverty. And finally, the sword or execution itself does not mean that God's love for us has failed. You know, Paul talks about every one of these things in 2 Corinthians 11. There he provides a list of all the terrible things he faced in the course of his ministry. As he was going around preaching the gospel, all of these things happened to him. He faced all of them. He faced all opposition. He faced all of these hardships. And I think the list here in Romans 8 truly has been Paul's reality. But he seems to be saying this to us. I know for a fact that the presence of these circumstances in my life are not an indication that the love of Christ has somehow failed. Instead, Paul says, it has always been the constant love of Christ that has enabled me to face these things and to conquer these things. The presence of these things doesn't mean that that we no longer possess the love of God. Instead, their presence calls us to run deeper into the love of God, to embrace the love of God, to trust the love of God, and hence the quotation from Psalm 44 that comes next from Paul. For your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Listen, Paul says, God hasn't hidden from us the fact that these things will follow his people. I know we hate hardship. I know we hate the loss of comfort. And I know we hate the, the, the loss of security. But Paul says, these things are going to come to God's people. Can it bother us? Yes. Should it bother us? Probably. Should it control us? Never. And should it cause us to lose joy and hope? Absolutely not. If it does, again, we are holding on and trusting in the wrong things. Because God hasn't hidden from us the fact that these things would follow his people Paul would write to Timothy that all who live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. We've been warned in advance 
of having to face these types of things. The hardships of life are not going to vanish just because you give your life to Jesus Christ. In fact, the potential for persecution only increases as you get more and more vocal with the gospel, as you do more and more work in the name of Christ, as you live more and more godly in this world. If you've read through the book of Acts, you know this. You've seen it. You've read it. The early church faced all of these things, many trials, many hardships. That's life in a fallen world. That's life in a world that's filled with rebellion towards God. It's to be expected. Truly, the warning of persecution goes all the way back to the garden. When God said he would put enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. See, God hasn't hidden the certainty of hardship and suffering, especially persecution. No, we've been warned. But we also know this, that the circumstances of life cannot separate us from the love of God. And they are definitely not an indication that we have somehow forfeited that love. In fact, if you look back just a few verses, you can see all, the, all these things, these, these things that Paul is listing here, all of these things are meant to work together for our good. These are the types of things that God uses to conform us to the image of Christ. Now, there aren't many things on this list that I would call good. And God would say, good, because that's not what I mean. What I mean is that I will take all of these bad things and I will use them for your good. Which is to conform you to the image of my son. That when you face these things, you have the opportunity to surrender to God and the Spirit and the Word of God and allow the fruit of the Spirit to respond to the event. And in that moment, you are being transformed by God, the Spirit of God, the Word of God, and now the child of God looks more like the child of God, Jesus Christ. It's why people like James could say, count it all joy when you face various trials. This is a moment for you to grow up. This is a moment for you to change. This is a moment for you to start reflecting the character of Jesus Christ. You know, the world and the enemy may throw these things against you thinking that they can defeat you, But here God says you are more than a conqueror because all these things simply accomplish my plan for you. Truly, the world can throw everything it has at us and it is helping God accomplish his plan, fulfilling his purpose for your life. The question is, how will you respond? Will you surrender to the Spirit of God and the Word of God? Or will you respond in the flesh? So there aren't, well, there isn't anything in this list that can provide any kind of evidence for the absence of God's love if it happens to us. His love has promised to take these things and to use them for our good and our glory. Not only his glory, but also our glory. That's why Paul can say, those whom he foreknew, he also glorified. Because when you look like Jesus Christ, that's your best day. 
That is your best day. You will be in glory. You will look glorious and splendid because you will be reflecting Jesus Christ back to God the Father. So when you're facing these things, know this, you are not alone. You're surrounded by God's love. You're surrounded by the prayers of the Son and the prayers of the Spirit. You aren't outside the love of God. You're facing these things from the center of his eternal love. And that truth leads us right into the rest of what Paul says here. Life and all it entails can't separate you from the love of Christ. Death? No, absolutely not. Death can't separate you from the love of Christ. It drives you right into the arms of that love. It delivers you deeper into that love. How about supernatural beings, the passage of time, the dangers of the created order? No, none of them can ever separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Nothing. God's plan for us is to know the fullness of his love for all eternity. And that plan will not fail. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. That's God's plan. So what should we do? In light of all this, what should we do? Well, let us continue to live for him. Let us boldly and courageously fulfill the mission he has called us to. When comfort and safety abandon us, the love of Christ will not he has conquered, and in him we are more than conquerors, no matter what life throws at us. No matter. So what can we say to all these things? I mean, that's the question Paul began our passage with. What can we say to all these things? We can say this. If God is executing the plan, if God's son died for the plan, if God has declared the success of the plan, if God the son prays for the fulfillment of the plan, then we can say nothing. Nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, We need these words. We need these words, Lord, because when life gets hard or when we fail, the fire in our hearts can grow cold. Sometimes it can grow callous. Sometimes it can grow hard. Sometimes it can be filled with doubt. Father, you know that. And I believe everybody in this room has experienced that. Father, I pray you would use these words to drive them deep into our souls and to change us, to truly do a work that only you can do, that only your spirit can do, that only your word can do. We need these words. We need these words, Lord, so that we could say about the world around us what Paul says in the verses that follow this that this is so precious to us that if we could see others experience it we'd be able to give it up because it would mean so much to someone else Father I pray that we would treasure these promises and the assurance of these promises and that they would radically transform the way we live, the way we behave. They would radically change the way we work, the kind of neighbors that we are, that they would radically make a difference in our families. That, Father, I pray for the parents here that these words would help them as they minister to their children 
and encourage them, that they would communicate hope. Father, I pray that a growing faith in these words would fill us with a hope that would drive us to love the world around us, even those who hate us. Father, I pray this because I know that you are able and you have called us to this very mission. Father, I pray that this church, in the power of your word and in the confidence that your word gives us, would have a tremendous impact in this city with the gospel for the name of Jesus. He died for that, Father. And I pray that you can make that happen through them. In Jesus' glorious name, amen.